Okay, this is um, the last section going into the second exam. It's not the whole chapter. Chapter six is fairly long, but uh, where this stops is where the information for the second exam will stop. Uh, and then we'll pick up the rest of the chapter going into the third exam. So we're gonna to continue to talk about cells We're going to start by talking about the outsides of cells. The caption here is, I'm talking to you. You're so, so, so thick membrane sometimes. Is it, uh, I like that she's got a wig on. That's okay. Um, one assumes it's a wig. You probably don't even recognize uh, this thing. Old TV with, uh, with rabbit ear antennas. A cell membrane is two layers of molecules kind of tail to tail. Is that uh, they are sort of lipids, but not quite lipids. They're called phospholipids. Now, like anything, you know, is that a, a, a science is kind of like a language. You build on stuff that, that was covered before. And in this case, think back, think back. Lipids are uh, a little core molecule, glycerol, with three carbons on it, and each carbon has a fatty acid attached to it. Well, this pink thing here is the glycerol, and here's a fatty acid, and here's a fatty acid, but on one of the carbons is a phosphate group. That's represented here by the, the this little circle, because it's not very big, it doesn't stick out very far, and then the fatty acids are represented by the, uh, the fork. Now this is a saturated fatty acid, so carbon, 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 carbon tends to keep it straight. This is an unsaturated uh, fatty acid, so a double bond tends to kink it. And when you put them, oops, when you put them into the layers here, is that it tends to space them out a little bit. These other things floating we'll talk about in a minute. But here again is the glycerol, fatty acids, and the phosphate group. Now the fatty acid part of the glycerol does what lipids do. Done like water, it's hydrophobic. The phosphate group, on the other hand, is attracted to water. It is hydrophilic. And that's all gonna hold together when I start to write this stuff down. So the cell membrane. By now, I'm assuming everybody has kind of learned that uh, just watching these things isn't enough. You got to kind of watch them like you were in class where you should be keeping notes. So you can go back over those notes later and not look at stuff going, I have no idea what any of this stuff meant. Maybe I need to watch the videos. I don't have time to watch the videos. It's, you know, it's a whole thing. When I'm recording this, you folks had just turned in your first exams. And uh, some of you did quite well. Some of you were very well prepared. You got yourselves organized the same way that you would in a class and it all worked fine. Because really, an exam that you got two days to do at home, if you're organized, is not a tough thing to handle. It's just a matter of making sure you understand the concepts that we've been dealing with, which is the cores, and that you can, because then you can find it. And then you, then you gotta be careful that you're actually answering the question that you were asked. That's one thing where people had problems, where I'd ask them a question and they'd answer a question, but it wouldn't be the question that I asked. So the wording is very specific. The answers need to be very specific. So the phospholipid bilayer, 
if you were to take these molecules and just dump them into water, this part down here is what it would look like. There'd be the water, here'd be the phosphates, and the little tails, because they don't like the water, would be sticking up in the air. But if you were to take that water and stir it up, shake it up, drive these molecules underneath the water, then they would naturally form bubbles. The bubbles would have water on the inside, water on the outside. Well, this is outside and this is inside from the labels. But they would naturally form this layer where the middle layer, there isn't any water. It's one hydrophobic molecule facing another hydrophobic molecule. And the parts that are okay with the water would face both the water on the outside and the water on the inside. This naturally happens if you take this kind of molecule and you shove it into the water with some agitation. It will naturally bubble up. Now, it'll also flow back up to the surface and form a, uh, just a single layer again. But later on, we'll talk about the very first cell membranes uh, existed where this sort of scum molecule was on the oceans. And of course, the oceans are very turbulent. And the first molecular systems that were eventually going to evolve into living systems were able to grab and stabilize the bubbles and hold them under the surface and have this protective layer around them. Because remember, that's what this is. This is a layer that's protective because things that are dissolved on the outside can't easily get to the inside through this barrier. It isolates what's going on inside a cell to what's uh, going on outside a cell. Now, it turns out a membrane isn't just this. It's also this. Floating around in the membrane are proteins, sometimes going all the way through, sometimes just floating in the surface, uh, sometimes actually in the middle. What you wind up with is uh, these things will naturally set up shop this way because the middle of the protein, the amino acids there, not crazy about water. So they naturally go into the hydrophobic part of the layer and ends of the molecule that are okay with water go into the hydrophilic ends. So you have these proteins kind of floating around in the membrane like icebergs. And they call that being embedded. This was originally called the fluid mosaic model. Now here's where you run into issues with, um, if you're a science person, if you're lucky enough to discover something new, then the question is, um, so what are we going to call it? And uh, so I imagine I'm making this up. I imagine a group of biologists, or biochemists probably, who had started to figure out how this layering worked and had that the, uh, the membrane was this kind of floaty membrane. These molecules don't need to stay attached to one another. The, the effect of the water tends to keep them in the layer, and so they tend to float around. These things embedded in them also can float with them, but a lot of times they're held down by things inside the cell because you may need the protein in a particular place doing a particular thing on the membrane. So I imagine a bunch of biologists in a room and they've just kind of figured this out. They're trying to figure out, okay, how do we tell people how this works? And who knows how much they were drinking because I can't imagine this working unless they've been drinking. One of the guys goes, so, um, so this stuff is all floaty, right? It's all like fluid, right? And they go, yeah. You know, 
Like imagine a, a, you know, a barrel full of water, you put a bunch of ping pong balls in there and you can stir the ping pong balls around. They kind of, and they all stay on the surface when you do that because they're, they're kind of fluid, they're floating around. They went, okay. And he goes, and then you've got these things stuck in them, sometimes in very complicated patterns. And they went, yeah. And he went, what's that thing? You ever gone to the museum and you're looking at like a, what looks like a painting from across the room? But when you get up really close to it, you find that it's really made up of like little pieces of glass or little pieces of stone, or sometimes, you know, if you were doing it online, you'd be seeing it made up of little pictures. And it, it, it'd go, what is that? What is that? There's a name for that. And they went, you mean a mosaic? They went, yeah, 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 yeah. A mosaic where there's a pattern and the pattern is really important and it's part of the big picture. Why don't we call this the fluid mosaic model? And the reason I think that there was a lot of drinking going on is because other people in the room went, yeah, okay, that'll be clear to everybody trying to learn this in basic biology classes. Uh, we're stuck with it. Is, is it's been the name of how the, the membrane works for, I wanna say over a century. So we're kind of stuck with this. So now the question is, we got all these proteins stuck in the membrane. What do they do in there? And I'll go back and write, some, write this down. But there's a lot of stuff that these proteins can be doing. Some of which we've already talked about when we talked about what proteins do. Is that some of these proteins are there to pick up information from the outside, very often other molecules. So they would be receptors and something would come in and attach to the receptor, the shape of the protein would change all the way through to the base, and that might activate something down inside the, the cell because that change in shape does something on the other end. There are, um, now this is, a, uh, the membrane is a way to control what's going in and out of the cell. Sometimes you don't wanna be that controlling. You just would like to have holes and some of these proteins are like, like stretched out donuts. They actually do have a little hole in the middle that doesn't have any membrane in it. And so stuff can just go through the, the, the holes. Now that gets a little tricky because some of the smallest stuff that can go through the holes are ions and you don't necessarily want ions, you know, just free flowing in and out of the cell. So a lot of times the holes have their own little charges around the rim, so it, uh, if a positive ion gets close, it gets repelled back out or negative ion gets repelled back out. So it's really uncharged little things that can go through, like sugars, like glucose. Um, now some stuff can just go through the membrane. Oxygen, not bothered by going through the membrane, is a uh, carbon dioxide goes through the membrane, doesn't need any kind of help. There are molecules that help stuff in and out. It would be going on its own, except it can't get through, so it helps. We'll talk about that a little bit later because the process of going through is gonna go to the next exam. Um, and then there uh, are molecules that move stuff from one side to the other that wouldn't naturally go in that particular direction. So let's talk about what the proteins do. So the proteins can be receptors, they can be pores or sometimes called channels. Now here's where we run into a nice thing, is that uh, most of this stuff has been discovered in the last 50 years. And when you get into that zone of time, an awful lot of the work being done is in uh, early on in England, but then later mostly in the United States. So there's an awful lot of names of things that are just like English words. And if you can kind of figure out what the English word means, like pore, pretty easy to tell what it is. Sometimes the pores are called channels because not everybody can agree on what to call them. Um, I mentioned sometimes things need help to get through the membrane. They're carriers. They will actually move stuff through the membrane. When things need to be moved and they don't really want to be moved, you have pumps. Now, in a multi-celled system like our system, our immune system is always 
checking molecules to see whether something that doesn't belong in us has gotten in. And how does it know our cells? Well, our cells have markers on them. And our immune system goes, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's the right kind of marker. That's us. Leave that alone. Let's go look over here and see if there's something for it. So markers can turn out to be uh, really important. And uh, and of course, being multi-celled, connectors are really, really important. Now, you don't need to know the types of connectors. I'm just throwing this up here to give you an idea. There's a lot of different ways to connect cells. Sometimes you connect cells and it's a very open connection and the cells are actually sharing stuff. In some cases, it's, um, it's kind of a free, it's kind of a loose, flexible connection. In some cases, it's a really tight connection. This, the, the, you want the cells on your skin to have a really tight connection. You don't want anything that can go squeeze between the cells going into uh, your body. So those cells are really zipped together really, really tightly. In other places, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, along your blood vessels, uh, there's stuff that you have in your blood, there's nutrients and stuff, doesn't easily go through a membrane. So you just have like loose connections between the, the cells on your, the, the, you have these kind of coiled up cells on your blood, little tiny blood vessels, but they don't connect too tightly. And there's little leaky gaps between them so that a lot of stuff just leaks out of the juice. A lot of nutrients get out to your tissues just by leaking out through the holes. Um, okay, one more thing I wanna mention before we, we wrap this up. Some cells build material around them, a casing. Plants do this. Funguses do this, bacteria do this, so Monera and Archaea have cell walls. Hope you're writing down, because I'm gonna expect you to remember this or be able to find it later. Animals, no cell walls. We are really the only group where that is a feature of the whole group. Protists are kind of all over the map. Some of them have cell walls, some of them have other kinds of casings, some of them don't have any casings at all. But um, Archaea, Monera, Plantae, Fungi, all cell walls of various materials. Plants, mostly carbohydrates, we've talked about that. Um, funguses, oh, this weird protein lipid combination uh, on their cell walls, but it's a, they don't need the flexibility the ability for the cells to move uh, uh, next to one another that animals do, right? Plants are pretty stiff. Funguses, not a really a lot of motion. Uh, single cell, you know, what's the matter? Is the casing can be protected. It can protect the cell from expanding too much. It can protect from some things getting in. The cell walls, typically things get in and out much better than they do through a membrane. But cell walls are a product of, uh, you know, four of the six kingdoms, and one of the kingdoms that has them or doesn't have them because protists are kind of, you know, they have animal characteristics, they have fungal characteristics, they have um, plant characteristics. Okay, that's, that's it for this section going into exam two. So it's gonna be posted that way Eventually, the rest of chapter six will be posted after exam two, and that'll go on to exam three.